We've been washed in his love, church. It was no one else's, it was no one else's love but his love. And we're in here because of grace. We're in here because of God's mercy. There's nothing that you, there's nothing that I, there's nothing that no one else has done in the past to earn a place before our Heavenly Father. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches us this, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so, I don't know about you, but I'll be a little bit honest up here. I maybe sinned once or twice or three times or a thousand. Any, any, anyone, anyone sinned in here? Anyone, anyone's made some mistakes, done some things that they regret, maybe ashamed and can't tell someone what you did last year, can't tell someone what you did last month. Some of us can't even confess what we did last night. But it's God's grace, it's the blood of Jesus that we have been made right before our Heavenly Father. And so when Christ's blood was shed, what you need to understand is this, that His blood washed over you. His blood washed over you. The Bible tells us this, that there's no, you, that we cannot have forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And there's nothing that you or I can do for one another to save each other. It doesn't matter how much I love you. It doesn't matter how much a father or a mother loves their child. At most we can pray. At most we can teach them. At most we can kind of guide them in the right way. But their blood can never purchase the price of your sin. Only one of the redeemed. That's the blood of Jesus. That's the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world that brought you and I righteousness. So let's thank God for his love. Let's thank God for his blood. Who's been washed in love? Who's been washed in love? Well, how amazing it is to be in God's house today. We have a great atmosphere here, and I want you to do this. Tell the person behind you, look behind you. Tell them, say, tell them, you can come. Tell them, you can come. Look to the person in front of you, to the left or the right. Let them know, say, you, you can come. Tell them, just as you are, you can come. Just as you are, you can come. Yes, you can. Just as I am, I come. And then the power of God is that he's able to change how you came. Right? Just as I am, I come to God, but then when you get to God, He has the power to change you from how you came to Him. That is the true power of salvation. Not that He just receives you as broken you, as hurting you, as sinful you. Is that He receives you just like that, but then His power, the power of His resurrection. See, there's, a pow there's power in the cross. But there's power in the resurrection. The power of the cross is that he washes you from your sin. And the power of his resurrection is this, that he now lives inside of you. And just as he rose from the grave in victory, then we too get up in that same power. Amen? And so if we're united in a death like his by water baptism, which symbolizes us dying as he died on the cross, then when we come up out of the waters, it symbolizes the power that we get to walk in. That's the power that we get to experience, that the things that held us down before no longer hold us down anymore. The thing that, 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 that was overwhelming me, I have now power over it. That's the power of the resurrection, that you don't have to stay how you were. So we get to come as we are. But then God's power is to change us from who we were. Amen? Well, let's do this. I'm ready for water baptism. I'm so excited. Um, we were in prayer this morning earlier, and uh, it's almost hard not to get emotional. Uh, and we prayed for today. I mean, we've been prayed, but this morning as we came, early in the morning, like 6.30 in the morning, we're here praying, and if anyone is invited to come and pray with us, we're here praying, and we said we're going to pray for today's service, and we're going to pray for the hearts. We're going to pray for everyone that comes into this place. I want you guys to know, first time guests and all, you guys are just as important as the person who's TDP family that's been with us from the beginning. And, and, and we were talking. And then I let, you know, the people that, you know, we were praying with, I said, 
baptism, what we're going to do today, and, and, and speak about the gospel, invite people to make a decision for Christ and go beneath waters all on the same day, I told him and said, this is why we do this. There's no other reason to put in lights and pay rent and put up cute pictures on the wall and make stages and all this kind of stuff like that and put speakers in. There's no other reason for that other than this. This is why we do what we do, church. And so we already know that some people already came ready to be baptized, and that means we can celebrate the victory already. We can, we can shout already right now, and we're going to thank God in advance for anyone who chooses Christ today and makes a decision to be bold and be water baptized. While you're standing, open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. We preach so many messages on baptism, and it's truly, this is truly one of the greatest things that we get to do as, as a son and daughter of God, to, to lead other people to Christ and to take them beneath waters and give them the opportunity to experience the new life in God. It's, it's the most rewarding thing ever. It's great, it's great when they can pay you for your services at the church and they can put you on a salary and a payroll. That's good. I understand it. We want to get there. But this reward to see people's lives change, people come to God, people find hope, that reward is more than enough. And so whether we ever get on payroll, church, whether I ever could cut you a check, church, this is the reward. This is the reward. This is the reward. You don't got to pay me to do this. It's good if you do. I'll take it. Go to Publix and to Nike Factory all on the same day. I'll take it. Buy me new shoes and all, but you refuse to pay me, I'll still preach. We'll still preach, right, church? Because we don't have to. We get to. Mark chapter 1, word of God reads the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The church says, amen. amen. Beginning at verse 4, it says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance. Okay? He preached a baptism of repentance. The repentance was connected to the message of water baptism. He didn't separate it. They weren't two different things. They weren't two different events. And, you know, you're ready for repentance, but you're not ready for water. You kind of, you he said his message of repentance was a baptism. Preaching a baptism of repentance, look, for the forgiveness of of sins. Then it says, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. They didn't confess their sins and John the Baptist said, great, I'm so glad that you accepted Christ and you've acknowledged your sin. Um, I'm going to send you back home. I'm going to send you an eight-week pamphlet on water baptism. And then we're going to send you a, a, a test, one through 50. And if you score, you know, uh, 40 and higher, then you can be baptized. He didn't do that. We do that. <laughs> we do it all the time. Churches do it all the time. So th this is what we teach. We preach that you're ready for Jesus but you're not ready for baptism, what, till you get to that next level. We separate them all the time. Churches have been doing it for years. As they confess their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan. We'll explain. It says, and this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I. It says, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. He said, I'm not even worthy to bow at his feet. I'm, 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 I'm not even worthy to go near his feet. That's, that's how worthy he is. I mean, usually when someone's of that much worth, you bow at their feet and, you know, you humble yourself. He said, but he's so much more than that kind of worth that I'm not even worth to bow down at his feet. He says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy 
Spirit. Someone say amen. We'll stop there. The title of my sermon today on baptism is After the Water. After the Water. After the Water. Tell the person next to you, it's after the water. It's after the water. It's after the water. Let me tell you, the, the water's good, but, but it's really after the water that counts. Amen? You guys may be seated. God bless you. Who's excited to be here today? I'm loving these young people. I'm going to preach right over here. Give me my little pulpit. I'll set it up right here. Who's excited to be here? This is true. The youth are the heart of any church. The youth are the heart of any church. And so parents, you that have these youth, you got to bring them here. You think it's a burden for you to drive them over here, put gas in the car to bring them here. But let me tell you this. You get them to the house of God and God gets a hold of them, they will make your church better. You'll be like, man, church was so good today. You don't even realize it's because you brought your kid. <laughs> wow, worship was so amazing. You don't realize it was your kid in that corner over there together with their friends and they were worshiping God. And they could be anywhere. They could be in another place right now. But they decided to be in the house of God and so we thank God for them. After the water. Recently, uh, we just came across a, a holiday. Anyone knows what that was? Or a celebration, right? Is, people, is that a holiday, right? It's, it's weird. Pe mixed, what is it? Valentine's Day, right? People got mixed emotions about it. I didn't realize how many people uh, <laughs> have so many mixed emotions about this holiday. Um, some of the things I've heard was, it's not a real holiday. I think it's dumb. It's dumb. And the reason why they thought it was dumb you know, and this was their argument, and I understand it, because we should love each other every day, right? And so why now? Because, you know, our country tells us this is the day of love, you know, and they believe that it's too commercialized and it's really just to promote business and get sales here, and I'm sure all of that's happening, right? But, but it's, we should love each other every day. Why do I have to now go spend all this money on this day? Because they're telling me this is the day of love. And some people are, you know, for that reason, they say, you know, me and my wife or me and my children, whatever, me and my person, we have no issue with loving each other. So, you know, boo to Valentine's Day. Any of those kind of people in here? Don't raise your hand, that's all right. I understand. And then there's people who don't like the holiday because of this. They actually get no love. Through, they get no love throughout the... <laughs> all the youth making noise. They get, <laughs> there's, some, there's some people that... Because there's no love exchange where love should be exchanged, then they see it as superficial. And it's like, you don't tell me you love me throughout the whole entire year, and now because of the holiday, now you come home with flowers and chocolates, right? And so you have these mixed emotions about the holiday. And some people would say it's kind of overrated. It's an overrated celebration. The reason why it's overrated, because we do something on that day that ends on that day, and it doesn't carry after into the days ahead. And so I'm kind of, I kind of had that same feeling, not necessarily with Valentine's Day, but I do have that same sentiment of how we have overrated celebration of things, and we participate on them on that day, but the minute the day is over, we do not have the commitment for them tomorrow. And so this is, this is very true. We, we have overrated celebrations all the time. Some, you know, the, some of the weddings that we've celebrated were overrated celebrations. So much money was spent and so much time was put into it. And so we have participants on the day, but they were not willing to make the same commitment tomorrow. And so you see so many things happen with relationships and, and, you know, during this time. And we have overrated graduation ceremony parties. It's like the whole school throws this whole graduation and there's hats everywhere. And you got to be there for three hours listening to all these people's names. And you know you only care about one name that day, right? <laughs> and it's hot. Why are they always hot? Why are they always hot? What's wrong? Like... Why the ACs never work and it's always 103 degrees outside 
And so we have this overrated celebration. Oh, and trust me, I'm not against graduations. My wife would punch me right now if she was here. Um, she loves graduations. But sometimes they're overrated in the celebration because we're celebrating that, great, they got their education, which is supposed to get them on this career path. And then there's no career path. And we, got, we, we celebrated so much. And check this out. The student now has how many dollars in student loans? And then we all showed up to the college and we all threw our hats and we sat there for three hours to, to make this grand celebration. And then people participated on that day, but they made no commitment to it on the day after. It's, I would call that an overrated celebration. By no means am I against Valentine's Day and graduations <laughs> or weddings. I perform them. But what I'm saying is this. If you're going to participate in today, it's really what happens after. And so this is our problem. We celebrate things like they're, going to, like, like they're dead. And the way to really celebrate something is like it's going to live. And so if you're going to get married and have that grand celebration, don't celebrate the marriage and let it end like, oh, this was the top of it. No, it was really just the beginning. And so when you celebrate, you have to have life in mind for the next day for that thing. And if you go through all that schooling and you acquire all those student loans, you better get a job. If not, you know, you, if you go through all that schooling and all those years and all those studies, don't celebrate your graduation like, yay, it's over, it's ended. Celebrate it like now it's alive and I got to commit to this the day after. And the last thing that I want is for us to have a celebration, an overrated celebration of water baptism that we're all here and we're all ready and we got towels and we got t-shirts and some of you got your swimming shorts on and you've even put on suntan lotion like there's going to be sun in here and you're more than ready and your whole family is here and we're all ready to celebrate you because you're going to participate today. But I don't want us to have an overrated celebration of water baptism if we're not willing to commit to tomorrow in the new life that God gives us through the water baptism. So I want to tell you this. Sometimes what happens after is just as, a, as important as what happens during. And you can't get caught up in that moment only. And, and, and it's crazy. I'm going to share something with you. I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it, Josh. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed. Do you know what I'm going to say, Josh? He knows what I'm going to say. And, and I'm sure other churches will, will, will be able to share with me if they're really honest. Churches always, you know, they'll put up, oh, we baptized 100 people today. We baptized 50 people today. We baptized 25 people today. And right, we post all these pictures and there's people coming out of the water like this. You know, it's like, you know, praise Jesus, you know, like, and, and their shirts are awesome. I have decided, you know, beneath waters, I rise up, whatever it is. Not today, devil, not today. I don't know. Right, you got all these awesome shirts, right? Not today, Satan, right? And we have these grand celebrations and then there's these pictures and we fill up the bath and we, and we, and we, we, we we, we tell everyone how many people we baptized, but then if we were asked, well, how many people came back after their baptism? <laughs> baptized 25, one person stood in the church. And so, so that's the reality that we have experienced in our church. We call it the baptism curse. <laughs> that I even joke like, should we, should we stop baptizing people? Because they tend to stay in the church longer as long as we don't baptize them, but the minute we baptize them, you know, they come up with arms lifted high, and then out the door they go, and they never come back. But today I'm believing that we're going to break that curse in Jesus' name, because what happens after the water is going to be our focus. So everyone that's going to be baptized today, we're going to celebrate you, we're going to clap for you, your arms can go up, my arms will go up too, but what happens after the water is the most important thing. Your baptism is not the end of something. It's only the beginning of what God wants to do. And so John the Baptist, you got to understand, John the Baptist was the first person that introduced water baptism and connected it to confessing and repentance of sin for the forgiveness of sin. That was John's message. That's why it, it, it highlights so wonderfully in the passage of Scripture. And, and, and Mark writes it this way. He wants you to know that John has connected repentance of sin not to a temple, not to a sacrifice, not to an animal, not to a worship system. He, he, he connected re, uh, uh, forgiveness of sins to water baptism. 
And what you also need to understand that later on, uh, Jesus did the very same thing too. Of course, Jesus then comes and then, you know, he, he lives his life. He has his ministry for three years. He dies on the cross. He resurrects and he appears to his disciples and then he gives them this instruction in Matthew 28, 19. I want you to see it, that the message of water baptism didn't start with John and end with John because John later on is beheaded and killed. But Jesus himself, this is what he tells his disciples to do. This is what Jesus tells the church to do. So for us today to, to have a message of water baptism and preach it the way we do is because this is what Jesus commanded the church to do. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And it's beautiful. All nations. Doesn't matter what nation you're from. Doesn't matter what country you're from. Doesn't matter where you, where, uh, what background you had. Doesn't matter male, female, Jew, or Greek. It didn't matter. All nations. This message, the message of water baptism, the message of Christ Jesus. He died for everyone. Christ belongs to everyone. Not certain people, not a certain kind of people, not a certain class of people. Christ died for everyone. And I know we make a lot of reservations on all kinds of people. Oh, I'm not hanging out with you. I'm not talking to you. And you're scared, of, you know, to stand next to this person. I get that. I understand that. I'm a person too. But Christ, his sacrifice was made for everyone. Therefore, go and make disciples of what? All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you see, Jesus do the same thing that John the Baptist did. He connected the salvation experience of becoming a disciple together with water baptism. And so then what is water baptism? Thank God the scripture tells us that John connects it to repentance and so that there could be forgiveness of sins. And so baptism, what John did was this. John's message, as we read, he preached about a Messiah that was coming. He preached about him being so worthy that John himself could not even bow down and, and like be at his feet and untie his shoes. That's how worthy. So John's message to the people was this. The Messiah that, 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 that we've been speaking about, the, the Messiah that, that's been revealed in scriptures all this time, the one who's going to save us as the scriptures have foretold us, he is coming after me. And so uh, John's mother was Elizabeth, Jesus' mother was Mary, and they were cousins. So John and Jesus are related in that. And so John really didn't know necessarily that it was Jesus, but the Bible tells us this, that in the gospel of John, not John the Baptist, John the Baptist gospel, but in John, one of the disciples of Jesus, he writes that when John sees Jesus coming, he sees him, he says, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And in that moment, John has that, 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 that revelation, like, it's Jesus. It is Jesus. This, this is the Messiah. So he was preaching about the Messiah before he was able to even identify him. But that was the message that was in him. That was, was, was stirring up on the inside of him. And so he's preaching to the people, one there's a Messiah who's coming after me. I'm not worthy. He is worthy. And you have to embrace that message, and then you have to repent of your sins. That was John's message. He preached out in the wilderness. He was a wild man. He ate locusts and honey and wore some crazy clothes. He was a preacher, had his microphone out there, and that's what he preached, those two things. There's a Messiah that is coming, and you have to repent of your sins in order to embrace him. And as they, you would confess your sins, he was baptizing them in the Jordan River. There was no separation. There wasn't when you get to this next level and when you mature. And you know what? The minute you stop doing these three bad things, that's when you can get baptized. And, you know, when you get to this uh, spiritual understanding or when you get your behavior, you know, together, then you're ready for water baptism. And, and, and so it, it, John's message, it was together. You confess your sins, you accept the message of the Messiah who's coming, repent of your sins, and then you can be water baptized. And that's what he did. No separation. And so it's awesome because what does baptism do? I want to talk to you about four things quickly. The first one is I want to talk to you about the turn. Baptism is about a turn. Say a turn. It's a turn. John told them you have to repent of your sins. When you look at the word repent, 
I understood it to be this, that repentance is not necessarily just saying, I'm sorry. So we tend to, you know, I'm going to repent, I'm just going to say sorry. But when you study the word repent, it's not necessarily a word, it's more of an action. To repent, I understood it growing up, that it was to turn away, to, to, to turn, to turn, to, to change directions. And so, so the power in that is that we get to preach that what repentance is, is if you're headed in one direction, if you're headed this way because of your sin, if you're headed this way because of your life, if you're headed this way because of problems, if you're headed this way because of shame, that repenting is turning away from those things and then turning to God. But it was interesting. I was studying the word repent, and repent in Hebrew doesn't mean turn away. It actually means return to. And so I was growing up thinking that repent is to turn away from my sin. And so it's crazy, right? Because when we're preaching and we tell people, you have to repent of your sin, I know what happens to you because it happens to me. How in the world am I going to find the strength to turn away from all of this? Because there are things that I know are wrong, but I just don't know how to stop doing them. There are things that, there are paths that I'm on, and I know they're not helpful for me, and I even got a little bit of shame about them, but I can't, I, I don't have the strength to turn away from. And so, it's so powerful because when we think of repentance, that we, that's what we think of. How am I going to find the strength to let all of this stuff go? in order to do this church thing, in order to do this God thing, in order to do this Jesus thing, right? It's so hard to turn. Anyone here can agree with me that, that it's so hard on your own strength to make a turn from those things? Some of us got addictions that we can't talk about. Some of us got strongholds that were too shameful to even mention to, 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 to people around us or even the closest people. We, we're not going to talk about that stuff. So when we think of repentance, we think of how difficult it is because why? How do I get strength to turn away from those things? But check this out. The Hebrew word, word for repent is not to turn away from. The power of the word in Hebrew is to return to God. And when you understand that, this is what happens to us. We mix it up. We say, I have to turn away from my sin, and I got to find strength to let this go, let that go, stop doing this, right? So that I can turn to God. But that's not what repent is. Repentance is this. With all of that junk, with all of that addiction, with all of that mess that you have, turn to God. And once you get to God, God is more than able to deal with that stuff. And, and, and so it's not you getting rid of it on your own strength. It's impossible. I tried. I try to let it go, and I say, I'm going to stop doing this so that then I could be with God. I'm going to stop doing this so then I could be in God's presence. And you know what? More than 100% of the time, that never works out for humanity. That didn't work out for me. It doesn't work out for you. The only way it works to let go of that is with all of that, you bring it with you before God. And when you get in the presence of God, because you've been washed by his blood already, he's able to work with you with your mess. And then it's God's strength that then comes into you, that allows you to let go of those things so don't think turn away first think return to God and so that's why we're able to sing just as I am I come I wonder if this is what keeps people from coming to God in the first place because they're thinking they got to dump it all first before they can get to God. Because why? They feel like John the Baptist. I'm unworthy to be in his presence. But what you got to understand is that Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain, what? Before the foundations of the world. And yes, there was a time in history when it happened on the clock. But before the foundations of the world, the Lamb of God was slain for us. And so that's why you're able to come just as you are. Isn't that powerful? That repentance is not turning away from your sin, it's returning to God who is able to deal with you and your sin. Next thing I want to talk to you about is the direction. So baptism deals with a turn. It's, it's really about turning to God, and I want to tell every person in here, whether you came ready to be baptized or you didn't come ready to be baptized, that, 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 that baptism wants to get your turn right. And the turn is to return to God and God will be able to deal with you 
and your struggles and then your sin and then your weaknesses and then your flaws and then you get a strength from God, right? But baptism also gives us direction. Tell the person next to you, direction. When we look at Mark chapter 1, same chapter at verse 10, so John is in, the, is in the wilderness, and he's baptizing people in the Jordan as they confess their sins. In the Gospel of John, it tells us that, that John the Baptist sees Jesus coming and says, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of this world. And that Jesus comes to John the Baptist to be baptized. And when that happens, John's like, Me? Baptize you? How? Like, I, I know, even before you came, I know I was not even worthy to untie your shoes. Now that you're here, you're coming to me to be baptized? And Jesus says, suffer it to be so. To fulfill all righteousness, you must baptize me. So can you imagine how John feels? Like, wait a minute. This is the guy I've been preaching about to these people is here. I've been telling them, accept the Messiah, one, believe that there's a Messiah coming, and two, repent of their sins. That was the criteria to be baptized. That's what you need. Those were the qualifications. One, that you got to believe something in faith. And then you have to repent of your sin. So John, now Jesus is before John saying, you got to baptize me. And John's like, no, one, you're worthy. And two, you don't meet the requirements. He didn't. He superseded the requirements of baptism. Why? What was the first one? You got to believe that there's a Messiah that's coming. I think Jesus knew who he was. I think both John and Jesus at that point knew he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So there was nothing for Jesus to believe new about himself. And then the second criteria, what you had to do? You had to repent of your sins. I think Jesus was God, right? <laughs> I think he kind of knew that. I kind of think he remembered that he was in heaven and that he's the word of God becoming flesh dwelling among humanity. There was no sin for Jesus really to repent of. And so there's, there's multiple reasons why John is hesitant to baptize Jesus. But Jesus says, you must baptize me to fulfill all righteousness. And so it goes on to say this in, in, in verse 10. Put verse 10 up there for me. You just had it. Verse 10. It says, just as Jesus, so, so John baptizes Jesus. He says, okay. He said, you got to. He baptized him. It says, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. So there's something a little different about Jesus' baptism than everyone else's. <laughs> just a little bit different. I always say this. I would not have liked to be the guy who got baptized before Jesus. I would have been like, John, you cheated me. You cheated me because... I went down out in the water, came up. This guy goes in the water, who, 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 you know, whoever he is, and the heavens are being torn open. Spirits are coming down like doves. Later on, it says, and a voice spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I will please. What happened to my baptism? <laughs> like, this guy's got doves descending. No butterflies, nothing. Like, nothing flying around here. I didn't hear nothing. But John baptizes Jesus, and it's definitely different than everyone's. The heavens being torn open symbolize something different about water baptism too. And what it does is this, the voice comes out of heaven and starts saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so John, when Jesus came, he said, this is the lamb of God. And so he probably got the people's attention like, oh, this is him. This is, this is the guy. And then all of a sudden, the heavens tear open, and then God's voice is heard saying, this is my beloved son. And so Jesus gets baptized, right? The spirit, and, and it's so awesome because now you see Jesus, the son, you hear God's voice, and you see the spirit of God all together in one place, touching earth in that moment, validating baptism in the water. And from that day on, what does Jesus go on to tell his disciples? When you baptize people, you're not going to baptize them say, hey, I'm baptizing you with John's baptism. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father who was there, the Son who was there, and the Holy Spirit that was there. And so now the baptism is not a water baptism of John about a Messiah that might come and about repentance. 
It's a baptism in the confirmation that Christ Jesus is our Savior, and I have been washed by his blood, and I get to rise like he does. And so now the baptism that we do when we baptize people, when churches baptize people, we don't baptize you in the name of John the Baptist, in the name of the crazy guy in the wilderness. You know, we baptize people in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And so the water baptism that Jesus takes is of the revelation, the actuality of what John was trying to reveal in his. John was trying to reveal something through his water baptism. Jesus became the Christ that would die for us. And so why the water, right? Good question. Why the water? Well, what, what's this whole thing with the water? Well, when, we, when we're baptizing people, what you need to understand is this. The water itself represents death, like a grave, so to say. But it also represents washing at the same time, too. So when we baptize people and they go down beneath the water, it symbolizes death. Now, Christ had his death, his burial, and his resurrection. There's three components to Christ dying and our redemption. There was the cross, there was the tomb, and then it was empty, right? There was the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That was the order. Jesus died. He was buried in the tomb for a whole day, and then he got up on the third day. He walked the surf again, appeared before his disciples, commanding them to go make disciples of all nations. So when we baptize you, it symbolizes your death going into the water. As you're under the water, completely submerged, that's why we don't sprinkle you and throw water at you. We, we take you down under. You're like, you're going to die, right? You're going to die, right? It, it represents you going under and your, your, your old life dying to you. Your sins dying. And, and, and as you're under there, it's like how Jesus was in the grave. You're, you're in the grave. But when you come up out of the water, it represents a third-day resurrection. That when Jesus Christ resurrected, he came out that grave in a new power and authority that he did not have until he came out. And so it represents... Jesus had a new life, right? It was a new life. Um, and so you coming out of the water represents a new life. So that's why we can't have an overrated celebration, and we're not celebrating because you did it, and it's over. Oh, you finally got baptized. You fi check it off. It's done. No, we celebrate the new life that begins because it's what happens after the water that changes everything. This is how we're going to break this curse, Josh. We're going to teach that what happens after the water is more important. Amen. So you need the water, and you need the wedding ceremony, and you need the graduation, but it only begins something. It's just the beginning. And so I want to tell everyone here that gets baptized, the enemy will come after you like he's never come after you before. He will come after you with your sin. I'm going to be 100% real. Because you're going to go in there, we're going to baptize you, and we're going to say, you know, your, your sins are going to be buried in here, and you're going to come up a new, you know, new life in Christ, and that's awesome, you know. And then you're going to, might struggle with your sin again. And what happens to so many people, they give their lives to Jesus, they get baptized, then they commit a sin and say, oh my God, I'm so horrible, or this didn't work. This didn't fix anything. Or you're going to come out of the water, and then you're going to feel temptation later on and say, oh, that didn't work. You're going to come again and get baptized. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 you don't got to do that again. You just got to understand that. That's what the enemy will do. As a matter of fact, you know what happens to Jesus after he comes out his water baptism? The Bible tells us that he's led by the Spirit of God to go into fasting. He goes to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. And immediately when he's done fasting, the Bible says that the Satan comes to him to tempt him. This is the first time that the scriptures say that Satan came to Jesus. He came to him when? After the water. Your biggest fights are going to come after the water. The, the, the biggest trials are going to come after the water. And so what did Jesus do? He knew that after the water, that's when the enemy was going to come. So what did he do? He prepared himself in the word of God. He prepared himself with, through prayer, seeking the Father. All of that stuff happened after the water. So after the water is great, but you know what? Come back again next Sunday. After the water of today, come back to Bible study. After the water today, come back to the youth ministry. After, you know, after, after the water, get connected with family. Get into a C group. You search God, read your Bible, fast, pray. All of that needs to take place after the water. It's all what happens after the water. So Jesus, right, he comes up and it's amazing. 
And the Bible says when he came up, he saw the heavens. So when Jesus comes up, his direction now was heavenward. His, his direction now, he was facing, not behind him, not looking down. When he came up, he saw the heavens in front of him. The, the power of baptism is not just forgetting your past and talking about, I got baptized, my past is over there. I got baptized, my past, and I buried my sins in the water. And, you know, and, and we get stuck on, you know, after our baptism, talking about the past. And we're, it's almost like, okay, we baptize you from your past. Stop talking and stop dwelling on your past. So the power of baptism is not just forgetting the past, but it's about focusing you to your future. That's the power, the direction. Jesus was looking towards heaven. And the heavens tore open with him, symbolic of what God was about to release over him, what God was about to do through him, how the Spirit of God was coming down upon him. Everything was before him. His potential was before him. His anointing, his greater anointing, his greater purpose was now in front of him. It pointed him in the right direction. And that's what baptism does. It points you in a direction for you to walk towards. Never an end, never a closed door. It's always forward. So baptism is about a turn, it's about a direction. And baptism is about a fix. Baptism fixes something. We baptized someone here, and their baptism was very special. You know, like for me, we baptized so many people here, they didn't all come back, right? That's the reality. But there's a gentleman who's still here because of water baptism, and I love how he tells his testimony about it. He talks about his baptism. He talks about his salvation experience. That's Brother Darren over there. And Brother Darren always talks about it. Right there. Guy with the headphones pushing the slides. He's right there. He talks about his salvation experience and his baptism in a very profound way. He remembers that one of the things that stuck to him hearing the message on baptism was that before, you know, when you come up out of the waters, we, we typically think that God's going to fix everything. Like, like, like fix everything. Like if I had a problem with my wife at home and I got baptized, that problem was going to be gone. Or... <laughs> If there was an issue, you know, if I was struggling with something, temptation, I'm going to come out the water and it's just going to be all gone. You know, problem at school, whatever. We think that that's what baptism is going to fix. But what Darren says is that he remembers hearing the message about coming to God in baptism. And what he understood was this, that when you do that, when you give your life to God or when you go beneath waters and you come out, your life doesn't change. You have a life that you were living before the water. You come up out. We all clap for you. And that life stays the same. It doesn't fix those things how we would like them to fix those things. But what it does is this. It lets you know now that you're not going to go through that life. You're not going to be facing those struggles all by yourself now. Now you have God who is on your side. You are his son. You are his daughter. And that made the difference. So if we read the next verse, or put the same verse up again. That's verse 10. Let's put it up so they can see. Look, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven, right? So we see his direction. He's facing heaven now. But he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. Now, in all reality, heaven is the sky, right? He, he's looking towards heaven. He's looking towards the sky. He saw the sky before he went down. And when he came up, he saw the same sky. But this time he was able to see God in the sky. Right? As he's going down, as you're getting baptized, you're facing the sky. You're facing heaven. When he comes up out of the water, he's looking at the same heaven. The difference is that now he sees God coming through that very same heaven. I want to tell you what baptism fixes. Baptism doesn't change your sky. Baptism doesn't change the heaven. It doesn't even change the color. What it fixes is your perspective of looking at the same thing that you've been looking at. It, it, it changes your perspective on you facing the same thing you were facing. But this time, God is coming right through. God's presence is coming right through that same situation. God's new strength is coming right through that very same thing that you've been dealing with. And so the fix is not that everything changes. The fix is now that you see God in everything that you face. That's the fix. And the last thing I want to talk to you about, come up people, help me here, is the life. The life. Truly, when Jesus came up out of the water, his life wasn't ending. 
It wasn't the celebration, you know. I mean, heaven, you know, is being torn open on, on Jesus' behalf. You know, this is a grand celebration here. I can't imagine what the angels were doing behind, you know, that. We don't have any evidence of that. But I'm sure there was something going on in heaven. Maybe angels clapping like, okay, look at this. Jesus is now baptized and, you know, uh, uh, you know this is great. You know, he's, he's taking over John's baptism. It's all coming together now. And, and, and Jesus could, what, begin his ministry. Do you know that before his baptism, there was not a single miracle done? It's not that, what we have is know that Jesus, you know, at a young kid, he was in the temple, he was talking, and he was amazing, you know, the people in the temple, and the, all those people there, listen, they were just blown away that at that young age, he was able to c converse with them, have c conversations with, with them, and then, and then speak revealing things at such a young age. So we know from the beginning that Jesus was talking and, and being about his father's business, but not one miracle was done before his baptism. Not one blinded eye before the baptism was opened. Not one lame man got up and walked. Jesus didn't spit in nobody's eyes before this. He didn't tell people, you know, none of that stuff happened before this. It all happened after the water. Jesus came out in a greater anointing. The Bible tells us this, that in verse 11, and a voice came from heaven that said, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Today, I want to tell every son, every daughter in here that when you come out those waters, that God is pleased with you by your obedience to do this and two, because God just simply loves you. He absolutely loves you. With your situations, with your messed up sky, with your struggles and all, with your sins and all, God absolutely loves you. But when you surrender your life to Christ and you confess him and you, and, 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 and you repent and you turn, return back to him, then God is so ready to work in your life. He's so ready to get involved. He's so ready to reveal his true purpose for you. Some of us, the thing that's keeping us from truly experiencing God are things like water baptism. Where maybe you gave your life to God two years ago and you've been like, well, I'm not ready for that baptism thing yet. It was never meant to be separate. It was never meant to be separate. You're waiting to get to a certain place, get to a certain understanding. You know, once I, get, once I can memorize 10 scriptures, then I'll be baptized, you know. Once I'm really committed to church, once I become a volunteer, that's I'll wait for the next baptism, and that's when, you know. No. What's the criteria for being baptized, to be baptized? It hasn't changed much from John's. And it's only confirmed through the baptism of Jesus. We identify as Jesus, as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. We make him our personal Savior, and we turn to him. We could say, sorry for my sins. I don't think it hurts. I don't think it's wrong to tell God that, you know, you feel bad about the things that you've done. I'm sure God knows your heart. But true repentance is turning to him. Not just, we clap because you got water baptized and we celebrate. It's, it's returning to God. And then walking every day in Him. Seeking Him. Searching Him. Praying. Asking Him to reveal His will in your life. Surrendering your, your, surrendering your sins and your struggles to Him. And you might be dealing with stuff and things might be strongholds. Maybe you've been addicted to drugs for five years, maybe you've been an alcoholic for 10 years, that's very hard to drop overnight because I threw, threw you inside water. You take baths all the time, hopefully. It's really just water, but what it symbolizes and what it reveals is very important. And so the Bible says you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So it's the truth on water baptism, not necessarily the water. It's the truth on water baptism, it's the obedience to it that changes everything. And so this is the great invitation that we all have, that we get to experience a new life in Christ when we come up out of those waters. I want to read to you a passage in Romans and tell you what it says, a beautiful passage of Scripture. Just verse 4 and 5, it says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a what? New 
life. So here's the thing. The beautiful thing that in order for you to repent for your sin, you don't have to pay for it. Jesus already did. If you had to pay for it, then we would try to crucify you on a cross. But you wouldn't be able to pay for your own sin, so that would be pointless. We couldn't crucify your dad who loves you, your mom who loves you on your behalf, because why? They got dirt on them too. And so the unrighteous cannot pay for the unrighteous. Sin cannot pay for sin. Sin cannot be crucified on behalf of other sin. It doesn't work that way. And so that's why it was through Jesus' blood, the one and only who did no sin, commit no sin, pure and holy and righteous. That's why God had to get out of heaven, step into a meat suit, this human body, and die on our behalf for us because only perfection and righteousness could pay the price of sin. And so Jesus has already done that for us. You don't have to do that for you. You just have to accept that he has done that for you and walk in the power that he now gives you as you invite him in. The Bible tells us that, that God's desire is not to float around us. The Holy Ghost is not something that you got to catch in the air. Let me tell you, you know, oh, where's the Holy Ghost at? I feel him on this side of the church. Oh, maybe the Holy Ghost over here. They praising God loud over here. Oh, the Holy Ghost over here. Let me go over there. No, the Holy Ghost is not something you catch. The, Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit of God is something that you invite who lives on the inside of you. He doesn't float around like Casper. He comes to dwell inside of you. That's where God wants to be. And so Jesus said you don't have to go on a cross to die for your sin. I already did that. But you relate to my death through the water baptism. It's kind of how we we make the connection of dying, going into the water, like I explained, being buried, and then coming out. That's how we relate. That's why he said, oh, put, put, put verse 4 back up. We were therefore buried with him through baptism. You weren't buried with him because we hung you on a cross and put you in a tomb, and we're praying you get out on the third day like he did. No. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Let's read verse 5. It's awesome. For if we have been united with him, look, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, that's what the water is like, we certainly also will be united with him in a resurrection like his. Someone say Amen. amen. So there's a new life after the water, and that's what we're celebrating. That's why we want to baptize you so that you can walk in the new life that God gives you. Our celebration today is not going to be a celebration because cause, cause you got to the end of something. We're celebrating you today because you just began something. And it's amazing to know that we're going to do that in Christ. Come on, church. Stand to your feet. Can we just, can we just celebrate right now? Celebrate every life that's going to go beneath waters. Give God praise. Give God glory. If you have a friend, if you got a child, if you got a parent.